Chester. Put our hands together for Brian Thompson. Chester. 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 We call the falls. Oh, okay. Have you been uh, stateside before in the falls? Negative. No. This is first time on either side. Okay. And I was told by a Canadian that it's better on this side, and he said that <laughs> he said that's not just because he's a Canadian. We we do have the best view of both falls. And I'm I've got to say, as an American, you, you've stolen the best view. <laughs> so uh, you enjoying your visit uh, here to Niagara Falls? Uh, this has been has I have I enjoyed a convention visit to a new location more than this and I'm gonna say no awesome no this is a special place you know, this is a world-renowned destination I think uh, do they still have Niagara Falls like in all the geography books in grade school right I mean doesn't does everybody goes to grade school and say oh god I gotta go there someday no. yeah that's a pretty universal head nod. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's something. Uh, I, I grew up here. I don't know how many people are growing up local, but uh, it is something you, you kind of take for granted after a while. You know, I, I, I've worked in the falls and driven by by a thousand times, and you just it, it really is something else. When you say worked in the falls, <laughs> that's a very broad. <laughs> yes. So specifically, how do you work in the falls? Were you in, were you in one of the barrels that went over it? Yeah, I, I, it? I wish. It, it, that, was, that was actually uh, uh, something I thought I might want to do one day when I was little. Yeah. Yeah, I'm that guy. I, I, I like to chase the adrenaline. But, I mean, you, you're a bit of a – I know you windsurf. Do you do that in open water? Is that something you do on a lake or – Both. You windsurf where the wind blows and where it's wet. Yeah. <laughs> The, and I no longer windsurf. Does anybody in here follow the evolution of windsurfing? We got one in the back. Well, windsurfing, when you get good at windsurfing, what you want to do is be in the air. You want to be off, you want to jump, you want to find, you want to get going as fast as you can and just in the sky with the biggest ramp that you can hit and the best ramps are like an almost breaking wave, so that gets a little bit dicey. And then when you're in the air and you have maximum speed, all is good. And then your craft starts to lose speed, and it all goes to shit. <laughs> so you've got no aerodynamics, you've got no control. I have landed so hard that my mast bent and broke in half, just from the impact, just snap. And I've landed so hard that my feet have gone through the fiberglass of the deck. Well, what kind of air do you catch? On, uh, you, oh, you're lucky to get uh, more than 10 feet. Probably the biggest jumps, maybe 20 feet. And that's, you know, if you go off a 10-foot wave and maybe you get another 10 feet, for a moment you're, you're at 20 feet. And then hopefully you're, you know, you're landing gently on the backside of the next wave. Um, the, so, so you can see that wave jumping with the windsurfing board is, is a dicey proposition. Then came kites. Now with kites, getting in the air almost happens by, it, it can happen by accident. When you turn the kite and come the other way, when it comes up above and generates maximum lift and the kite gets hit by the wind, it just, whoo, it picks you right off the water. But it sets you down like you're on a parachute. So I kite surf for a while, but and you satisfy your lust for air. Part of what satisfies the lust for air is some really hairy wipeouts. About 10 years ago, foils got attached to the kite surfing boards. Are you guys familiar with the kite? Okay, everybody, right now, get your phones out and Google kite foiling. <laughs> and then the kites, somebody figured out how to modify the kite a little bit, and it became a wing, an inflatable wing, that you hold like a windsurfing sail, and it, and it behaves as if it was a windsurfing sail, but you also raise it over your head, and now it's a wing. And, it, and so... In windsurfing, you could not detach the sail. 
So that's why it lost most of its aerodynamic properties as it lost speed. But now with the wing, when it's over your head, you've got basically the same sort of parachute properties that you have when you had the kite. And with the hydrofoil, the wild thing is the harder the wind blows, the slower you can go. Because the wing is lifting that much more of your weight. So I'm a wing foiler now. So I'm no longer, the, to answer your question, I am no longer a windsurfer. Well, uh, like, like everything, it must evolve, right? Like everything must evolve. Does everything evolve? I guess not. No, no, de definitely not. Definitely not. Well, well, I'm going to go off one more tangent here, and then we're going to talk about uh, this man's illustrious career. I had to, uh, I had to don the uh, orange and black today. I know you're a Rams fan, and I just want to settle it right here once for all. We know that wasn't pass interference on that final drive with Logan Wilson, right? Not I mean, a oh god! Of course, that was it was <laughs> it was not pass interference. Was not. Was not. Was not. I mean, there were some shady calls in that game, but it was pass interference. <laughs> of course, it was. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. For for someone who's been a Bengals fan since the Boomer Esiason days, uh, I, I waited a long time for that for a playoff win, and then we just shot right to the freaking Super Bowl, and then just. So it's like expectations are so damn high in Cincinnati now. But uh, I, I was happy for Went, and I was happy for Stafford. I was a big uh, Barry Sanders fan, so I, I, Detroit spell, holds a special place in my heart. I'm a Wings fan too, so I was glad to see Stafford get one. Yeah, yeah, Stafford earned it. Yeah. So this year? We started uh, a little rough. We started a little rough. You guys started, started a little rough. Th they're yeah. still a little rough, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Super Bowl hangover, as they call it. Yeah. yeah, what's the hardest championship to win? The second one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you're a classically trained actor. Uh, you, you played a little football as well. Was, was that always the goal? Was football the goal? Was acting the goal? Did you have a, a, a set path uh, in high school or college? Uh, I think I would like most high school kids that don't know for sure what they wanted to do. Yeah. I actually went to college and had a piano scholarship. So I was a music major. And there was a kid who was my same age, who also had a piano scholarship, who was also a music major. His name was Jim Washburn. And Jim was a prodigy piano player. And I knew that if I practiced the piano eight hours a day for four years, I wasn't going to be as good as he already was. It was just, you know, it was staggeringly good. You know, people would, people would, when he was practicing, people would, he practiced in the concert room where the choir practiced because people would come and watch. And uh, so that was kind of my first disheartening realizing that I wasn't going to be the next Elton John. <laughs> And uh, I was playing football. Did I have dreams of being a professional football player? Uh, unrealistic ones. Yeah, I could probably do that. You know, a little bigger, a little faster. Uh, not a chance. I was at an NCAA Division II school. So the, the division between Division I and Division II is a, is a gulf about the size of the Atlantic. There's a huge huge with with golf and talent level with the exception of an occasional athlete in a division two school who accidentally ended up in division two who could have easily started in division one those are really really rare and uh so my my father was a very uh frustrated public school teacher who I had to listen to a lot of arguments about finances. We'll say that. I, anybody else relate to that? See their parents argue about money? Yeah, those are stressful, those are stressful things for children because they can't solve it. Yeah. And my dad, you should major in business. You should major in business. So Central Washington University's best college was business. 
So I sacrificed my sanity and took business classes. But I lived in the drama department. And I... Without exception, even the quarters that I played football, I figured out a way to be in a school play. So I I didn't really know anybody in the drama department. Uh, I mean, didn't, in the business department. Uh, and I lived. Uh, my backpack was had librettos and plays falling out of it, and I would I would hear famous monologues and they wouldn't leave me alone until I had memorized them. There was like, you know, Brian, you know, it just, you, you know, it won't, won't, it wouldn't settle till I had the words memorized and committed to memory. And then, uh, senior year rolls around, I'm a business major, and the company, I had worked on the Columbia River building docks, bridges, and piers during the summers to pay for college. And they had offered me a job when I got out of school, which was, as far as work goes, it was very exciting. You know, at the end of the day, you put in 100 feet of dock on the Columbia River. I mean, you really see some remarkable, substantive, huge objects. You know, you're using, you're using these 50-ton cranes on barges. You're in the river. It's... You know, going out across the river in a skiff as the sun's coming up over the Cascades. It, it was, as far as jobs go, tolerable. I get, I put on. It was tolerable, and uh, I actually had a panic attack that my senior fall quarter, my senior year. I think, I think, I think to date it's the only real panic attack I had. I was. I was walking across campus and they were doing, uh, they were sledgehammering the foundation of a building with a, 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 a jackhammer. And that summer I had I'd had to use a jackhammer on a dock in Longview, Washington. And it's a very percussive sound. And that percussion hit me in the abdomen and I got nauseous and started sweating. And I went back to my dorm room and I was like pacing. I'm like, what do you, what do you want to do? It's like, what's going on? Oh, you don't want to take that job. What do you want to do? Well, you, you want to be an actor. Fuck yeah. I do want to be an actor. Well, how can you make a living? You can't make a living as an actor. Yes, you can. You, you, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Well, where are you gonna go? So I, I I didn't know where how 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 do you get out of Ellensburg, Washington, to make a living as an actor? So I I wrote letters to the Screen Actors Guild and the Actors Equity Association, and they obviously get a lot of these letters. I was just so I got a form letter back. We do not recommend schools, but there is a book called Acting Professionally, written by Dr. Robert Cohen. Okay, well you go to the school library. Our people here remember the Dewey Decimal System where you had to actually... The Central Washington University Library had a copy of Acting Professionally. <laughs> and at the end of the book, he recommended 10 schools that also gave degrees as well as a professional actor training program, of which Dr. Cohen's school was one of them. So... I applied to these schools. Uh, I auditioned for some of them. The short story is that I got a full ride to Dr. Cohen's school after auditioning at the San Francisco Opera House in San Francisco about three months after I had initially written the first letter to the Actors Equity and Screen Actors Guild. And that was a, a Master's of Fine Arts program where you got a degree at the end. So if acting failed, you could teach. And uh, I act, sang, and danced 12 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, with few exceptions. And uh, because I had the business degree, you know, starting at the, my second year, I, what are the barriers to getting a job? 
how are you, you know, we're in school, we're having a great time, but how the hell are you going to get paid for this, right? So I said, well, you've got to you've got to be able to pull off good auditions. So I would, because of Irvine's proximity to Hollywood, I would sneak and skip classes sometimes to go to auditions. There was a, a rag called the drama called Drama Log, and they posted open audition calls. I, I stood in line for three hours that year uh, outside Warner Brothers to uh, for an open call for Lady Hawk. And uh, and and while I was standing in that line, some New York actor was standing behind me. He's like, "Hey." you'd make a really good heavy. <laughs> and I'm like, what's a heavy? It's like, you know, the guy, the guy, the muscle, the guy with the, the, you know, the gun, the guy that holds the gun on the people, the heavy. I'm like, oh, oh okay. Yeah. That's the first time I'd heard that. Um, anyway, th there was a lot of fun, serendipitous things that happened that year, but I started getting the jobs while I was still in school. And one of the jobs, I met this, one of the auditions was in a room, I swear to God, not much bigger than this table. The, the, there was a picnic table in there, there was two people behind it, and on the other side was this frizzy-haired, kind of blondish guy with a perm, he was 29 years old, and there was this frizzy young lady next to him, she was in her 20s also, and they said they were going to make a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger called The Terminator. And the guy said his name was Jim Cameron. Nobody knew who the heck these guys were. And I, I uh, think the last line of the audition was, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> and Jim Cameron looked at me and goes, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> and a few days later, that's how I got my job in the Terminator. And to this day, Still the best movie I've ever been in. Not by, not by a little bit, but by, by the Gulf of the Atlantic Ocean, plus the Pacific Ocean, plus the Mediterranean, plus the Indian Ocean, and the uh, straits of whatever else belongs between those bodies of water. Um, so that is the, that's the condensed, that's the cliff notes on how uh, son of two teachers who grew up on the end of a dead-end road in the middle of Washington ended up making a living as an actor. Uh, a, a huge movie at the time, obviously. Uh, you were a fan. A lot of people had seen it, you know, was Rocky. And then you, you get the audition for Cobra. Yeah, uh, how, how intimidating was that? Did did you audition? Did did you meet Stallone before the audition? During the audition? After the audition? It was a it was a series of seven auditions. Uh, the last one being a screen test. The first audition was for the Joy Todd, the casting director. The dialogue was um, as twisted and as messed up as any dialogue I've ever seen. <laughs> Was this something uh, like the the big speech at the end? There It was the big speech at the oh, okay. end. Okay, that was what you had to audition with. Right. You know, you want to go to hell, come up and bleed pig. Uh, that all the and and I remember reading that the first time, and <laughs> you know, hitting at me like it was almost a foreign language. And and then, how do you digest that? And then I I wrote a whole t to make sense of it. I wrote a. It's got to be in a, bo a box somewhere. I wrote like this two typed out two page long credo. The, the character was called ba Baden at the time or Abaddon. Baden, Abaddon. I think it was Abaddon. Doesn't matter. So I sort of wrote out this whole credo of what his philosophy was, and then that gave him this sort of political passion for the speech, like he was almost a politician but at the same time, totally fucked up. And so, I, you know, I, uh, the, the audition was the, the casting director. Then I met the director, you know, George Comet, Comatose. And uh, then I met with him again. Then I got to meet Sly. 
And Sly, I remember he asked me the one question, uh, are you ready to play a lead in a f major feature movie? And I s said, that's what I've been training for for the last several years. <laughs> yes. And uh, then he called me back in again, and he s told me that he thought I was too nice to play a bad guy in a movie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Brian, you just seem like a nice guy. <clears throat> Brian, you seem like a nice guy. Um, I, I, I said, I answered something kind of political about acting, but you know, well, there's there's acting involved or something. I didn't. I, I wasn't sarcastic. I, I, I was very. I'm sure I was very like child to parent. I was in awe. I mean, you know, Rocky was. He was Rocky. <laughs> I, I mean, and Rocky Four was out at that time, the number one movie in the world. Yeah. So I'm sitting. I mean. Like the theme from Rocky is the last song I played on my bass clarinet when I graduated from high school. <laughs> it's still to this day played at many sporting events. Yeah. True or false? True. True. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Starstruck? Yeah, as, <laughs> as much as as much as Starstruck as you can get. Yeah. So then he said, "Well, we're well, we're, we're going to have to screen test you. So we're going to get it. We're going to get some cameras together and make up artists, and we're going to shoot the we're going to shoot this scene. Are you ready for that? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm, I can do it. And uh, then we had the screen test. So during while we were doing this, I was um, I had, for two years I had had the job as the evil villain Taurus Mordor in the Conan show, and if you can imagine Animal House times ten, that's what this job was at Universal Studios. You got it was it it, it was. Anybody by chance ever see the Conan live show at Universal Studios? It was a it was a eighteen minute sword and sorcery spectacular, where young Conan turned into muscular Conan through the help of an old wizard and an incantation and disappeared inside a, a CO two cloud and and reappeared as. And getting that job was a whole, that was a whole story. That was 3,000 people auditioning for about 40 positions. We were on Entertainment Tonight. Universal Studios uh, publicized the shit out of it. It was the first time I was on national television because they played part of my audition on Entertainment Tonight the day that I auditioned. Anyway, I got that job at Universal Studios, and I had that job my last year in college, and everybody at the show knew uh, of, that I was auditioning for Stallone because these seven auditions took place over the better part of a month. Maybe it had been more than a month. So everybody was like, hey, what happened? You know, everybody. Because in that two years, many of us had gotten uh, our first jobs and our SAG cards and our agents because most of us that had auditioned at Universal Studios had never had a job in Hollywood before. It was a, you know, we were getting a park job. And the, uh, the stage that we worked on was a three-story building, and the middle story backstage was a makeup room where a lot of things went on in that makeup room, and not everybody was wearing all their clothes when these things went on. <laughs> because imagine a work... This was our work schedule. You had to do, this, you had to do the play... It was 18 minutes. You had to do it four times in an eight-hour day. So that means you had three two-hour lunches. Does everybody compute that? <laughs> we were half-dressed, or not even really that dressed, and, and, and paid to go out in the park and meet the guests, if you wanted to. It was on a voluntary basis. Cause, and, and you had all these people coming there who wanted to meet actors. 
they asked you, we were signing autographs by the dozens just because we were an actor in a show at the Universal Studios tour. Anyway, two years of this together, I got we we were bonded. We we were closer than any group of people could get. Yeah, because we'd been through breakups and divorces, you know, college graduations. A lot can happen in two years when you're in your mid twenties. So, you do the show. Normally, everybody is it's kind of bedlam backstage. On this particular day, it was. I, I came upstairs. And it was dead silence. And, you know, Conan's there in a loincloth. And Red Sonja's there in a leather bikini. And Zaymore the Pick with Big Harry. You know, it was like Mr. Universe. And the other warriors. And the makeup artist holding the phone. And she says, your agent's on the phone. Take the phone. She says, she says Brian... You got the job, and their first offer is fifty thousand dollars. I swear, I, I swear, I got the job, and I immediately was dogpiled on the floor. <laughs> I was getting punched in the arm. Red Sonia was rubbing her tits in my face. <laughs> I was like, just you know, just bad them. The I mean, just erupting, like like everybody in the room had just won the Super Bowl. And uh, I will never get another job to top that feeling. Because yeah. if I got that job, that means that they could too. Yeah. And, and what a, what, you know, I could have been at home on my day off when I got that call. So that it happened then. It was... sort of un it was a pinnacle of a bit of receiving a job yeah no doubt uh we're gonna get some questions in a second i'm gonna ask one more here uh i think uh you played a lot of action roles you work with uh john claude van damme lightheart uh, i mean a whole bunch of others but comedy uh comedy i think uh is something that you uh really loved and i gotta ask about joe dirt <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how did you get the role, and uh, how much fun was that with David Spade? You know, th there's a there's a side story to that, which is fucking tragic. It was f it was fun as hell. I went to the audition. I, I remember the one audition. Um, there was a there was a self tape. It was a taping with the casting director that they saw that they liked, and then I went to the audition. I met. Uh, uh, the director, David Spade, wasn't at the audition. Um, so it's just a <laughs> tell you what a space cadet David Spade is. So I meet David Spade's first day in the set. We're in the we're in the bus on, riding on the way to the set. He's sitting next to me, and he's he's like looking off in space, like he does. Like I mean, he really is this guy that is like. And he's like, oh, man, you're not going to believe who we almost got to play your part. And he, he went on and listed this guy that he really wanted to have the part. And there was like three other people in the bus. And they're all, they're, I, I kind of like look at him. And David's totally off in his head remembering this person he really wanted to have for the part. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he looks at me and he goes... Oh, oh, you're you're, you're gonna you're gonna be really good too. <laughs> <laughs> That's David Spade. He is that out there. He, he's just kind of, and a lot of his comedy is these, you know, almost connected thoughts that flit through his brain. That's David Spade. So uh, yes, it still was a lot of fun. That day on the set actually was a, a, a real giggle. However, the last day, the day with the pit. And the dog and the licking of the face and the it puts on the lotion was so fucked up i can't tell you that because <laughs> and not because of anything to do with the movie i was in a custody battle for my children with against the biggest 
att divorce attorneys in America, Neil Hirsch and and Joseph Manis. I mean, these guys at that time got four hundred and twenty-five dollars an hour, and and it was draining all of my finances. But the day of court was scheduled on the same day of filming. And I only had to work one day that whole month. And the whole and it and they called me up like two days before I was supposed to film is on the same effing day. So I go to but where's my call times at like two thirty in the afternoon and courts at eight thirty. So we get to court and there's like some emergency hearing. We get shoved aside and shoved to the afternoon. So it's a custody battle and I don't, I'm not supposed to be there for my kids. Talk about, you know, rock and a heart. So we call the production company and we beg them to let, to let me shoot it on another day. And, and what do they say? They say, if you're not here at 2.30, we're gonna sue your ass into high heaven. So I'm like, one fucking day. It's like, how? Couldn't this be tomorrow? That's all it would take, it would just be tomorrow. It's like, talk about anxiety. And uh, so I had to go to set. And, and my attorney and I apologized to the judge, and hopefully the judge understood. And it was a, it was a custody battle, and, and my attorney promised me that he would call me by 4.30, that's when courts shut down in LA. They just die, they just, like, the hours that court actually gets run is a crime. It's obs it's just it's all set up so that attorneys can bill a bazillion hours. A side note of my attorney, I had this whole list of questions that I wanted to ask my attorney that day because if I asked him over the phone, I'd get billed for them. But since we had to sit and wait in the courtroom, this is this is a true story. Um, so I had this list of questions. I pull it out. We're sitting outside the courtroom. I said, Joseph, I, I asked my first question. He's like. Uh, Leave me alone. I've got phone calls to make. I'm double billing. Shut up. All, all attorneys do it. As my attorney that I was paying $425 an hour to, swear to God, he told me that. That's an attorney. Anyway. Uh, so I'm trying to act in a comedy when I have no idea what's going on in a courtroom. I talk about anxiety. Okay, so 4.30 comes along. I'm calling. I, don't, I, ne I never was given his personal cell number, so I'm calling the office. No, we haven't heard from Joseph. 5.30 goes by. 6.30 goes by. I'm, and, I'm ha and I'm having to act in front of the camera and just like squelch this anxiety. Finally, at 7.30, I get a phone call three hours later. Oh yeah, Brian, everything's fine. Yeah, no, custody schedule's the same. They, they, they didn't get a single extra day. You're, you're still, you know, 50-50. Um, well, why didn't you call me? He said, oh, well, you know, uh, why didn't you call me? You said you'd call me. I'm having to work on a set. Uh, uh, hey, listen, I gotta go. And he hangs up on me. And the cliff notes on that story is that my ex-wife's attorney and his attorney, what had happened is they went out to dinner together and they were discussing the finalization of them joining companies. Yeah, and which turned out to be the most fantastic thing ever because it was a conflict of interest and I didn't have to pay the $88,000 that I owed them. <laughs> so, which is, you know, that's $88,000 after taxes, that's a healthy chunk of change. Yeah, so that was, but, the Joe Dirt thing could have been the biggest giggle of my life, and I was just, you know, after 7.30 that night, I'm like, oh my God. But those, those three hours was just, it, ah, God, it was just pain. Well, I testament to your acting skills then. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, you know, I don't really remember the day. Maybe, this, maybe the good stuff that they kept happened after 7.30 that day. Because <laughs> I, was, I was just... Oh, man. And I couldn't I tell him, and, and I couldn't whisper, a, I couldn't say anything to anybody on the set. 
because you know then you burden them with oh brian's yeah. freaked out i uh, the same day. Come on, why couldn't it be tomorrow? Why can't the baby be tomorrow? Do we tomorrow? have uh, questions for Brian? No, they don't have any questions. <laughs> All right, we're going to go here, here, and then here. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to you for coming today. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else here does too. I am a really big fan of Cobra. It's one of my all-time favorite 80s action films. Um, I wa I've watched it at least 10 times, and that's probably it. And this is where the law stops and I start. <laughs> I watched it the other night. Yeah, I, I consider it one of the best 80s action movies ever made. Every time you call Sylvester Stallone a pig, it gives me chills. Like, I think it's just a brilliant delivery. I really love it a lot. Um, well, let me interject before you answer that question. The word pig, you know, Stallone is a, is a, has a very wonderful visual dramatic uh, uh, sense. And the, that shot the close-up of pig, he completely set that up. He told him what color of lights to use. He told him, put water in your mouth, put Vaseline on his face. I want the camera at this angle. And Brian, I want you to splatter when you say pig. And that's all, that shot of the word was just for that word that he completely set up. Um, I was going to ask you a Cobra question, but you sharing your story about getting the job for Cobra was, that was amazing. I really enjoyed that, that story. Can you tell us a tiny bit about Kindred the Embrace, your work on that, and how you got that, and what you thought of it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I had just come off doing Key West and had a, one of the more flush bank accounts in my life. Key West, you, know, you mentioned comedy. The longest, most lucrative job of my life was in a comedy was playing Sheriff Cody, the Zen Buddhist Sheriff of Key West, Florida, 13 episodes. To this day, the most lucrative job was fantastic. I got to live in Key West, Florida. That's where I learned to windsurf. There was a sign outside my condo, 10 windsurfing lessons, $100. I'm in. That's how it happened. And that, that also you know, changed the trajectory of my, my life and where I ended up spending vacations. Um, but back, so anyway, Kindred the Embraced, yeah, I auditioned for it. Uh, I initially auditioned for the Nosferatu character, which they offered me the part of, and one of the, the only th time in my life I turned it down. I said, you know what, I'm not, uh, just before that, I, I think I'd done like three or four prosthetic jobs a year before, like every day to get that pumpkin head glued to your skin. I'm like, no, no thank you, I don't want it. And like a week later, they said, would you play Eddie Fiore? I'm like, does he have any makeup? <laughs> no, he's just normal makeup. I said, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's one of those rare times when, y y you know, you, I did help shape my career. Um, so that's how I got that job. The, um, the sad part of the kindred, uh, Brian, he tells sad stories. It's a shame. <laughs> was that the scripts were really similar? The uh, you know we would go have the new script read through, and we'd like elbow our, Isn't that exactly what you said last week? Yeah, and the week before. And so you know when when they actually aired the season, the three of the episodes they didn't even air. They cut it off before they, they think they shot eight. And, uh, and this, this was one of those producer stories that uh, there was a guy named John Leakley. It was his first producing job. And since he was a producer, he could also hire himself as a writer. Hence the reason we had these scripts that were repeating themselves. And um, in, the, in the one episode, I had, I had uh, led a a coup I was trying to take over. And then the next episode, there was no reference to the fact that I had been, that Eddie had been a bad boy. No reference whatsoever. And that was like, that's dumb. <laughs> so I went up, I said, John, what, what, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if uh, there was vampire penance? Or, or maybe some type of vampire parole, because we have this governing body, we have this, these board meetings. What, when you act up and you 
try to pull a coup, there, yeah, like what would vampire penance be? You know, I, I had some ideas, but I was going to let, like, maybe that would catch his imagination, take over. And, and he, like, looks at me and he walks away. <laughs> a little while later that night, I make my way to him again. Hey, John, don't you think, vamp you know, like vampire parole, or maybe we could have a Nosferatu, like, shadowing him? In the background, that would that would kind of solve it. And he looks up at me. His, he had a Hitler complex. He was he was, you know, I think he even got on the balls of his feet that propelled him to a vertical height of five feet two. <laughs> and said, "How about if we write you off the show? Would that be penance enough?" <laughs> Swear to God, a producer like I'm so, I'm so, I'm supposed to go on camera. And he said that to me. That's how clueless he is about the creative process. Um, seriously, you need to teach, create actors, you need to treat them like children. And I'm not joking on this because you wanna create a safe environment where they feel free to play. That's how you get the best performance out of actors. And this idiot didn't even know that. So I responded to him, I said, well, John, it would make more sense than what you're doing now. And the next episode, the next, the title of the next episode was "The Rise and Fall of Eddie Fiore." <laughs> and I, and the guy, he got his kicks off because they had a, you know, they had a prosthetic made of my head, and they were tossing it around on the set, you know, smearing blood on it, and kicking it across the floor like a soccer ball. That's what producers get to do for a minute. A couple years later, I was at an audition, and the guy goes, "Oh, I see you worked here with John Leakley." What was that like? <laughs> um, not good. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin this interview by coming off as too negative. He goes, "No, you won't." We had to fire him off our project too. The, I, I, I honestly think Klingons are a little easier than, than other characters because of the lack of subtext, <laughs> right? Aren't they, like, they are, their behavior is pretty cut and dried motivated. And since there were lots of Klingons that had gone before me, unlike the part in Cobra where, where, where planets this dude from, there was a planet and people and similar voices to to draw on and also they are which makes them very you know classically driven sort of like the greek plays in that there's not there's not a lot of subtext in the greek plays either you know they're they're heroes and there's villains and they um although the very first one lieutenant clagg obviously it was the first, really the first time they were letting the Klingons show a bit of sensitivity and humanity. Um, I, like, I couldn't remember any other Klingon episode where the Klingons were trying to share their culture. I mean, was there, I don't think that happened before then. So now they're saying that the Klingons are seeing the value in sharing culture and, and trying to have a little bit of cultural interchange. So I, I really, I, I saw the value of that also. Um, do you do you cosplay? Do you dress up for? No. Well, you have that great a makeup applied to your face, and you look in the mirror. You know, and you're trying to make the rubber move, and you speak like lower your voice a little bit. Well, you, and you, there's a wonderful feeling to, to look in the mirror and see that you are a hundred percent that that character. So that you know, the final probably the final dashes of the of the ingredients are are the uh, makeup and wardrobe. Sure. Okay, uh, for me, uh, on, not movie related, 
but uh, I think in our conversation from earlier, my beautiful orange cargo electric truck that you saw. Yes. Uh, the website you said for the 25 watt, uh, 25 amp controller, Alibaba or Alibaba? Alibaba. It, Alibaba. Uh, it could be AliExpress. One of the two. Yeah, he's got a 500 watt Bafang. He needs to add a few more horsepower too. So I, he should really get a 25 amp controller. Anybody else here want to second that? He needs a 25 amp controller. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. I can, can you see the building or is it? I don't think you can see it from here, but it's probably five minutes from here. I was there Saturday night for the uh, class reunion of 1972. Now, I, it covered a 10 year period, but 72 was James Cameron's year. He wasn't at the reunion, but uh, he, w he did go to a previous Stanford reunion. Uh, some, uh, the year Titanic came out, he was at the Stanford. But it's very close to here, so what a small world we have. Really? Jim, right here. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can't miss it, because when you drive up, you welcome to Chippewa, the birthplace of... James Jim Cameron. But they haven't renamed it James Cameron High? No. No, no not yet. <coughs> it's a very old school. It's one of the oldest in our Yeah. But you went there and... Uh, had the year been 77, instead of 72? It was 72. Well, 72. Uh, well, I graduated in 77, and and it, it was I was 24 when I met Jim, and he was supposedly 29. So that's five years difference. Seven from five is two. 72. Wow. That's uh, that. Your story is adding up. <laughs> Have, has there been any like substantial donation to the visual arts program there? Uh, there, there is a theater at Stanford. It used, it's in uh, when I went to Stanford, it was the Tech Wing with all the shop and woodworking and electricity. It's now the school's more arts oriented, so the Tech Wing is mostly taken over by arts. Type. Do they still have metal shop, wood shop, auto shop? Oh, really? Ah. Oh, nice. Nice. I know that one of the, you know, one of the, I, I see it as a kind of a virus that, you know, went across America and Canada was the reduction of metal shops and wood shops from the high schools. Because those are, you know, those are invaluable classes. And, and look what, there's a shortage of people who know how to do that stuff now. <laughs> how could that have happened? That was one of the biggest surprise parts of my life because it was a, a singular audition that got taped one time. And, you know, since I had been, you know, in that Conan show at Universal, Universal, you know, I knew what real body, you know, what, there's so many giant bodies and I'm about half their size. I, I'm muscular, but those guys are like, you know, they're Mr. Universes and I... I didn't really think that my addition was, I, I knew that the, the acting part was okay, but I just didn't think I filled the shoes, so to speak, or the moccasins or sandals, whatever. It was ex sandals. So when I got that, um, actually I'll tell a personal story. I hadn't thought about it. I, I, I went to the audition and then I didn't think much about it. This was pre divorce story that I told you earlier. So, I, 
my ex-wife had hired Ivana Trump's attorneys, and my current attorneys were acting like they were trying to get a job in their, their guy's office, which wasn't good for the custody battle. So I wanted to hire this expensive attorney, but I didn't have the money. So I said, well, where are you going to get the money? You're going like, to sell your house. So I called up the real estate agent. I told her to put the house on the market. And I took my last, you know, $10,000. And I, you know, took my checkbook. And I was on my way to the attorney's office to give him the retainer for a down payment on the retainer because the full retainer was $40,000. And I dropped by to, they, you know, back then you needed 8 by 10. So I, my agent said they needed some 8 by 10s. And I went in the office and it was a Jewish holiday. And the assistant was there, and he said, hey, Daryl's at the whatever, Yom Kippur or something, um, and I'm authorized to tell you that um, they're offering you the part of Hercules, and the first offer is $100,000. And all I heard in, in my head was, this is the money for your children. So that was, that's what I remember about that job. And that was the money for, that, that paid the attorneys that, and then it turned out you didn't have to pay all of it, but um, <laughs> that, that job happened really fast. You know, it was one audition and then it was like a week later, I got the job? You gotta be kidding. I didn't have to go through a series of callbacks and get beat up and wow. So that's, uh, and then, the process of filming was fantastic. We uh, we got to work in Turkey and and uh, Leavesden Studios in uh, and Shepherd. Uh, no, Le I'm sorry, Mortal Kombat was Leavesden. Uh, we got, worked at Shepherdin in England, where they put us up in uh, the you know the marvelous Soho Hotel in the West End, and got to see plays in London and go hang out with the British actors. Um, uh, yeah, I was uh, working on the Mediterranean in a in a in a rowboat. The tending vessel was a ferry that had, you know, it was a ferry for like a hundred people. So we had lots of, and, and and one of the sets we would have to travel by boat. It was a good hour from the dock along the Mediterranean into this in that beautiful little one of the alcove that they had a little, little bay um, it was all a marvelous adventure it was very much like being an Argonaut because it had the adventure aspect to it and then I also oh the other part was I took creatine I, I don't I don't advise this talk to your doctor it's a <laughs> it's a it's a kind of salt that allows your muscle tissue to hold more water, and and that water with the amount of, and and your muscles recover absurdly fast. And when you when you pump up, you know how you do too much weight, they start to feel they pump up like that. And I went from two twenty to two forty five in a month, and it was like and. I don't know that I took a solid shit that entire <laughs> time because my stomach was like, it's like hell on your stomach. Maybe there's intravenous ways to do it. I just did it from what I read at the time. I Maybe they've refined it, but it's uh, like two weeks before we finish shooting, uh, it's no more creatine. And I haven't taken any since. Not, I mean, I think there's still a, a crusted dried bottle of it in my <laughs> kitchen cupboard somewhere well we're definitely not going to top that story uh i've been following your career a long time uh a big fan and uh so this was a real pleasure to do it so put your hands together for brian thompson everybody thank you i'm happy to be at the falls i'll, I'll be a little i'll be a little sad leaving here honestly <laughs> <laughs>